Hey y'all, welcome back to another round of physics. And uh, as promised, uh, this video will deal mainly with the uh, moment of inertia of an object. So moment of inertia. Of inertia. Say I. Okay. Man. That doesn't look very pretty, does it? Still haven't figured out everything. So let's go at it. So I remind you, let's remember the definition of the moment of inertia is the sum on I of the individual particles you're dealing with times their distance to the rotation axis squared. So if you have multiple particles, you have to do this multiple times. Of course, if you have a continuous distribution, which we'll deal with later, you could also write this as the integral of R squared times dm. Okay. So one of the things I should note is it is very important for you to pay attention to where the rotation point is. So where is rotation? Or maybe I should say where is pivot? That might be a better way to say it. Okay. So it's really important for you to think about where the pivot point is. Okay. Well let's go ahead and get some idea about how to use this equation. So I'm going to, let's not worry about continuous distributions at this point. We'll get rid of that. And let's go ahead with just, we'll dive into a problem and just get some idea about this. So let's say, for example, I have a square, square box, and on the corners there are four masses. So I've got one, I've got two, I've got three, and I've got four. Okay. And let's say for the moment that the, the actual square is um, uh, massless but we have to worry about these suckers, these masses that are on the corners. Okay. And we'll even call each one, let's call each one a mass M. So we'll say that each one of these has a mass M. We'll say that the square has a side length of L, call it capital L. And let's go ahead and we'll rotate it about the center, the dead center. And the question is, what is the moment of inertia for this arrangement? Okay, so take a second, pause it, hack it out. Good. Well, let me first start off. I'm going to start off. Let me, let me do the moment of inertia for this upper right-hand corner. Because okay? remember, the moment of inertia of the system is simply the sum of each of the individual pieces. Okay. You could actually, I guess we could write this as the moment of inertia of the system equals the moment of inertia for mass one plus the moment of inertia for mass two plus that for mass three plus that for mass four. So I guess you could break it up into the individual masses and do it this way. So let's go ahead, let's find the moment of inertia for this first mass. So I'll just call that moment of inertia mass one. Well, using our handy dandy definition, that's given simply by mass. And the part that I have to pause about is figuring out this. Right, this is what my RI represents. Right. So I gotta be careful there. How do I get this distance? Well, you probably are recognized, well, Greg, I can do that. This distance is L over two, two. This distance is also L over two. So I have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And I know that the hypotenuse of that should be square root of two times the side length. Okay, so at the end of the day, my distance is the square root of two times my side length, L over two. That's the distance, and then we recall, hey, let's not forget to square that sucker. Of course, we could do some uh, simplification. 
square root of two squared is two, square root of, or two squared itself is four. So you end up with something that says, okay, well, the moment of inertia is ML divided by two. Right? The moment of inertia for that mass located on the corner of a square about a point, pivot point in the center is ML over two. And excuse me, there's a square there, right? Don't forget that. But wait, there's more, right? We're, we only did the first particle. We still need to do two and three and four. And here's, of course, you already know the kicker. Sometimes your life can be made far easier when you have symmetry. Symmetry. Okay. So in this case, you recognize there's what we would call a rotational symmetry. In other words, if I took this arrangement and I rotated it 90 degrees, it would look exactly the same again, right? Since all the masses are the same, they're all located the same distance from the rotation point. If I rotate by 90 degrees, I get the exact same arrangement again. So we call that a rotational symmetry. But where it really matters right now is that because of that, we can simply say, hey, the moment of inertia of each of the individual masses is also going to be equal to this. In other words, my total moment of inertia of the system is just going to be 4 times ml squared over 2. Or if you prefer, canceling out, we get 2 ml L squared. There is the moment of inertia of this system. Cool. Well, let's go a step further. In fact, let me save that. So I'll delete this rigmarole. We'll just save that final result for right now. And I'll, I'll make a note here. This is the moment of inertia about the center. Of course, you can see where we're probably going to go next. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of some of this. Now I'm going to use the same apparatus. Okay. So I'll use the same apparatus here. Let's go ahead and get all, rid of all that. But instead... Let's say instead of rotating about the center like last time, let's rotate it about one of the corners. And let's find the moment of inertia if you rotate it about one of the corners here. Okay? Go. And you're done. Good. Well, at least you took a, sh a shot at it. So let's go ahead. Let's say the moment of inertia of the system is equal to... I guess here I'll just say it's the sum of the individual momenta. There we go. And I'll go through, let's label this 2, 3, and 4. So just starting from upper left and going clockwise around, I have this. Well, we have to be more careful now, right? Let's go ahead and find the moment of inertia of mass 1. Well, it's the mass of mass 1 times its distance from the rotation point. And right now, already you see, okay, well, previously the, the rotation axis is here, right in the center. Now it's down here. It's changed it. So that's going to change this R value. And in specifically, that R value now becomes just L. Right? It's the side length of the square. Say so squared. Of course. Right? They squ R squared. And we're done. Of course, you immediately notice, well, the same thing happens for M3. It's a distance L away. And so I have I3 is equal to, say, M3 L squared. Of course, I called all these masses the same, but you, this is more general that you could have different masses. And then the last one is, okay, well, now we've got to figure out what this distance is. Right? The diagonal of the square. So if you wanted that for 2, it's mass 2. And again, we have a 45, 45, 90. So this would be the square root of 2 times the side length squared. 
You say, well, wait, what about I-4? What's the moment of inertia due to mass 4? You say, ah, cool. No calculation necessary. Mass 4 is located on the rotation axis, and so it doesn't contribute to the moment of inertia. This is, of course, we're making spherical cows in space. It's point particles. So in this case, we see the system, the moment of inertia of the system, is 2 times ml squared plus contribution from m2, 2 ml squared. Assuming the mass is the same, of course, well, this is equal to 4 ml squared. You can see that by moving the rotation axis from the center to the one of the sides, we have increased the moment of inertia, and therefore, is it going to be easier or harder to rotate the object? Harder, right? The moment of inertia went up. That means if you apply a torque, it will not have as much of an angular acceleration. Right? If the moment of inertia has increased and you apply the same torque, the angular acceleration will decrease. It's harder to get this thing to turn. This is exactly like what we did last time. We said take your pen and twiddle it about the center. Take it and twiddle it about one of the ends. Same mass, right? but it's how the mass is distributed, how far away it is from the pivot point that actually changes the moment of inertia. Here's another example of that. Okay. Well, one more for good measure. Different one. So uh, we've done, oh yeah, excuse me. Let's go ahead and write that down. This is moment of inertia equals 4ml squared about, we'll say is a corner corner. Well, just one more for good measure. So let's go ahead and get rid of all that rigmarole. And uh, we'll try to fill that in as best we can. Okay, so, so I've got piglet pink instead of, you know, something else. Okay, well, last one. Here's a different one for you. Let's see, what is the moment of inertia if I rotate the square about an axis in the plane of the square. In other words, I take this square and I'm going to rotate it like this. It's kind of like, here's my square. I'm going to rotate it about this axis, like this. If you can see that. Oh, kind of bad at it. Okay. What's the moment of inertia there? I got this. All right, we'll start off with, hey, the total moment of inertia, and I guess I'll write this out, I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4. Well, okay, if I look at M1, now it is a distance L over two away from the rotation axis, right? So I'm doing that, here's my rotation axis. You don't have to do it like, you know, to this point or this point. No, you're gonna do the shortest distance here. Or sometimes it's called the perpendicular distance, okay? So you want the R vector, excuse me, I drove that the wrong direction. You want it to go from the rotation axis to the point in space. And that R vector should be perpendicular to the rotation axis. And indeed, it was last time, too. Okay. So the shortest perpendicular distance is what you want. So here, we'll have m, and we have l over 2, over 2 squared. You say, oh, wait a minute. Okay, if this is what we define as our r vector, the distance to the rotation axis, then each of my particles has that. Right? Each of my point masses is like that. They're all L over 2 away. So what I end up with at the end of the day is 
ml squared. Oh, goody, goody, the two and the four cancel. And so I end up with this. I system equals ml squared. Evidently, if I had a square plate or a square with these four masses, evidently it's harder to, the easiest rotation would be like this, right? Assuming this is a square and actually represents our thing. A set slightly harder would be this, right? About the center. And even harder would be about one edge. Okay. Pretty cool. Okay. So that's all I have to say about that for right now. So if you have individual point masses, find the moment of inertia for each of the point masses, then add the, 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 the mass together at the end, the moment of inertia. Okay, so find the moment of inertia for each of the point masses, then sum up at the end. Let's go on to another problem. Okay, so that takes care of the, you know, how to do moment of inertia problems for discrete masses. Of course, you have to, you know, you can add more masses or do a different arrangement or whatnot, but that's, that's the basic idea of it. So let's go ahead uh, and take a moment and I, uh, identify how do we actually do the moment of inertia for continuous objects? So continuous objects. U.S. objects. In other words, ones that we don't have as discrete masses. So for an example, let's go ahead, let's take a very thin bar. So we'll make this a really thin bar that has some distance L. So we'll call it capital L, and it has a mass of capital M. And for sake of making it easier for right now, let's go ahead and assume that it's uniform mass density. In other words, the mass is distributed equally throughout the entire bar. Generally, how we would represent that is we'd say, okay, well, uniform mass density, in other words, lambda, will be equal to m over l. That's generally what we would do to represent a uniform mass density. And I'll say, um, if you said a uniform charge density, it would be kind of the same idea. It would be the total charge divided by the total length, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that being said, let's go ahead and pick a rotation point. Why don't we go ahead and first start by doing a rotation point right here at the center. In fact, let me, yeah, right there at the center. I was going to say, let's get rid of all those little hash marks. That was ill-suited for our problem. Okay. Of course, we lost our equation here. So let's go ahead and let's calculate the moment of inertia about the center point right there, right in the dead center. And the question is, how do we go about actually setting up this equation and solving it? Well, you know the basic idea. I still need to take each of these individual masses, and for each individual mass, I will f calculate the quantity m r squared. The only difference is, is that now it's an infinitesimally small mass, so I'll call it dm. And rather than doing the summation, because they're infinitesimally small, we'll do the integral. Same idea, it's just uh, they do different notations to represent discrete versus continuous. So this is what we actually need to do. Now taking my rotation axis to be right here, and I'll go ahead and set the origin at my rotation axis, or the pivot point, that means that r, I'll call this direction, I will call x. And that means that I need to take the summation from negative l over 2 to positive l over 2. Furthermore, because it's a 1D object, my r is going to just become x. So let me rewrite this. I'll have something like i is equal to the integral from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2, x squared. And now I need to come up with an expression for this little infinitesimal chunk of mass that I've called dm. Well, we have the linear density. 
And if I take the linear density and I multiply by a small distance dx, you'll notice the small distance dx cancels with the L. And evidently, I will end up with a very small mass, just a portion of the total. So that's what I'm going to write down here. I'm going to write this as m over l. And I can do that again because the distribution was uniform. Times dx. And there is the expression that I actually need. I need to integrate this. Fortunately, you notice that this is constant. So I can pull that out. And so I get something that says equals m over l integral from L over 2 to L over 2. So negative L over 2 to positive L over 2 x squared dx. The question then becomes, what function, when you take a derivative, do you get x squared? Survey says, excuse me, still just snoshy here. Good, one third x cubed. So evidently we have m over l times one third x cubed. You can see if I take the derivative of this, I end up with x squared. And I need to evaluate this at two spots at the endpoints, l over two and negative l over two. Uh, you don't need me to do this. You've got it yourself, probably. I is equal to m over l, one third. We have l over two to the third minus one third negative. That negative sign's really important here. L over two to the third. And I'll do a close bracket here. Go. So at the end of the day, we have m over l. Well, let's see, 2 to the third is 8 times 3 is 24. So I have l cubed over 24. And you notice, okay, 2 cubed, negative 2 cubed is negative 8. So I have negative 1 over 24, and then I subtract it, which means I get a plus cubed over 24. Ta-da! To rotate a bar about its center of mass, well, let's see, we have 24 over 24, so this would give me 1 12th. And I'd have an L cubed. So, to rotate a thin bar about its center of mass, We could just simply, rather than having to do this, well, I should say, this is the moment of inertia for a thin bar rotated about its center of mass. Now, notice we did the exact same thing that we did in the previous problem. We took the small masses, we summed, we found the moment of inertia for each of the small masses, and then we simply took the sum. The only difference here is that the, the math looks a little bit more complicated because it's an infinite summation. It's an infinite number of point masses between negative L over 2 and L over 2. Okay? Pretty cool. And if we look up in a chart, which I'll have to post at the end of this video, we'll see that indeed this is the right value. Cool. <clears throat> well, let's go again. Again, more. Oh, yes. Well, of course... You could see that now you could see where you could end up with a whole bunch of, a whole slew of things, right? So, yeah, we'll keep this idea. So I'll keep it M over L. The thing I'm going to change, let's go ahead and change this little thing right here. Oops. Let's see if I can actually erase that. Nope. So the thing I want to change, let's see if we can get rid of that. There we go. Why don't we go ahead and we try a different scenario? Same bar. We'll do a thin bar. And what I'm going to do is let's say now, instead of doing it about the center, let's go ahead and rotate it about one of the ends. Take a minute, go ahead and set up the equation. You 
You got it? So I'm still going to use x since we're dealing with 1d. So we still have x squared. We still have this m over l, right, representing the mass m over l dx, representing the mass of that little chunk there. And hopefully you see the only thing that changes here is that now I, my limits need to change. I go from a value of x equals 0 for the, the little mass that's right there on the rotation point to the mass right out here, which is at x equals l. So I got to sum all the way between those two locations. Well, I'm sure you're already off and rolling like a herd of turtles. Bale, bale of turtles. Should have something like this. Right? We've already done this antiderivative. This is just a constant, so we just pull it out front. Boom, we've got the answer right here. And the only thing left to do is to evaluate it. <laughs> So, well, let's see. We have ML squared times one-third. That's evaluating at the L. And, of course, you notice that because we, we have X, we're multiplying by X. When we put zero in, we're going to end up with zero. So here is, again, here is the moment of inertia for a 1D thin bar rotated about an endpoint. Right? It's pretty cool. Let me show you another one. I'll show you a different way that we could actually get this. And this is actually why I did that. You remember, so this is about one end. This is about the center. 12 ml squared. This is the center. And I believe I made mention in the past video where I consider rotational motion to be the motion about the center of mass. Okay. And here I think is a really cool idea. Here's an idea where we can use that. Let me think about this rotation as being comprised of two parts. One is the rotation about the center of mass. And the second one I'm going to think about is, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call this the orbit of the center of mass about the pivot. Okay. So I'm going to think about two separate pieces here. I'm going to think about the moment of inertia about the center of mass of the object. And then I'm going to think about the moment of inertia of the center of mass about the pivot point. So I'm breaking it into two pieces. Okay. So let's go ahead and consider it for this bar right here. Okay. And I said, okay, well, piece one, the moment of inertia about the center, the center of mass, I should say. Okay. Well, that would just be this 1 12th m L squared. Okay. Now the moment of inertia for the second piece of the center of mass about the pivot. Well, since this is a uniform bar, the center of mass is right here. So how far away is the center of mass from my pivot location? L over 2. So this is about the center of mass, 1 12th. And then I could say, well, the moment of inertia of the center of mass about the pivot point, well, that's just going to be simply m times l over 2 squared. <laughs> Evidently, the total moment of inertia, say total, should be equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the moment of inertia about the pivot point. Put PP here. Let's double check this. 1 12th plus 1 4th ML squared. Well, we find a common denominator. 3 12ths plus 1 12th. That gives me 4 12ths. 
ml squared. And of course you see that if we factor or if we cancel, we end up with this. In other words, the exact expression that we had gotten via the integration methods doing the infinite summation. Okay. This idea of thinking about it as the rotation about the center of mass and then the orbit of the center of mass about the pivot, this is sometimes referred to as the parallel allel axis theorem. Okay. The idea being, if you have some object, say our thin bar, and you want to shift the pivot from the center of mass to another location. Okay. The parallel axis theorem says that you simply have to add in an extra term of the mass of the object multiplied by what I'll call how far you've shifted the pivot. So I'll call it shift. And that's it. So when you actually, yeah. So say for example, instead of shifting it to the end here, I shifted it a quarter. Okay. Well, in that case, you just use L over four here and boom, you're done. You add that term onto the rotation about the center of mass. Okay. So when you look at the chart, and of course I'll put it up at the end of the slide, but when you look at the chart and you say, okay, well, I'm asked to find the moment of inertia of a disk about the edge of the disk. You say, I can't do that. And I say, no, yes, you can. You use the idea about the moment of inertia about the center of the disk, and then you apply the parallel axis theorem and shift the center of mass by the radius of the disk. In fact, maybe we'll do that after we start talking about 2D objects. Gird your loins, here comes the next one. get rid of that. So let's go ahead. Let's work another problem here. Get myself comfortable. Okay. So how about this? Let's do the moment of inertia of a, a rectangular plate about the center. So a rectangular plate about center. Okay. Well, Let's go ahead, I'll just draw a quick sketch. Very rough. We'll call this distance A, we'll call that distance B. And we need two distances. And we're gonna rotate it about an axis through the center of the plate. Okay. And again, we're doing the same idea. Let's say I've got a little chunk here Okay, right there, I need to know what's the moment of inertia of that little chunk about this rotation axis. Oh yes, let's say the plate has a mass of L, M, excuse me. So the first thing I'm gonna do is let's see if we can come up with an expression for this little chunk. And um, I will call, oops, excuse me. I will call this direction X. I'll call, you know, up. I guess I'll call Y and out of the board or out of the page, I'll call Z. So we're gonna be integrating in the X and the Z direction here. Well, what I would first start off with is Sigma is equal to M divided by AB. In other words, let's assume that the plate is uniform. Maybe I should say it's uniform. And because it's uniform, I can take that whole mass and divide it out by the whole, the entire area and get an aerial mass density. Okay. Well, you know the song and dance now. I want to find the moment of inertia and that's going to be equal to the integral of r squared dm. And I just need to come up with some expression for dm and r squared. Go ahead, take a minute. You got it? Rock and roll. 
So because I have the sigma, what I'll do is, let's think about it, dm would simply be my infinitesimally small area, which I will represent as dx dz times sigma. So you notice now, I have to do a summation not over one direction, but two. And this is sometimes referred to as a double integral. So now I've got two of these, because I've got to do it over the x direction, I've got to do it over the z direction. Okay. Well, hopefully you see the distance is just going to be given by x squared plus z squared. Let's say, okay, well, this piece is a distance x from the rotation axis, and it's a distance z in this direction. So I must need to find the hypotenuse of the triangle, which is x squared plus z squared square rooted. And then I take advantage of the fact that the r is also squared. So I get x squared plus z squared times sigma dx dz. And the last thing that's left to do is we need to figure out what are the limits of integration here. I need to do this from what distance to what distance. Now to let you know, commonly what happens is the first infinitesimal length is associated with the first, the inside integral sign. So you work away from inside outwards. So if you wanted to, most mathematicians and even you know physicists were all lazy. If you wanted to, wow, you could think of taking that middle one and putting a parenthesis in like this. So you do the inside one, then you do the outside one. Most people won't put those parentheses in. Okay. Well, let's take a look at what we have here. So if x goes a distance, x represents a length of b. Evidently, we must go from negative b over 2 to b over 2. Similarly, y or the z goes from a distance of a over 2 to a over 2. Okay. Now we just do the integration. So the first one, since z and x are independent, we can go ahead and we can just integrate. So what we get here, well, first off we have, we do the inside integral first, so we have negative a over two to a over two. We'll pull the sigma out since the sigma is a constant. The antiderivative of x squared. So what do we have to take a derivative of in order to get x squared? Well, that would be one third x cubed. And the derivative of what will give me just plain old z squared? Well, that would just be x times z squared. Here we go. And of course, we need to evaluate this at negative b over 2 to b over 2. And once we do that, then we do dz. Okay. Now, I'm being careful here. There are sometimes right here, okay, notice that these are both constants. But as you progress in your calculus career, you'll find that sometimes you can set this this will be a function of z. So then it'll be very important to do the evaluation before you do the next integral. Okay. Here you could actually do both integrals right away and then just do the evaluation at the end. I'll be more um, rigor, or not rigorous, but I'll, I'll be slower than that. So, so we have negative a over two to a over two. One third times b over two cubed plus b over 2 times z squared 
So that's just evaluating at the upper limit. And we need the lower limit. One third negative b over two cubed plus negative b over two z squared. Of course, we still need that dz in there. And this looks like a mess, but notice I have a minus and a minus. And actually that minus is here as well. So what I end up with is notice that this is going to be added to that. This will be added to that. So I have two. So I'll just pull two sigma out. A over two. And we will have, well, one, I guess I'll put B cubed over 24 plus B Z squared. Nope, I should be careful. I pulled the two out. So this would still be over two. There we go. B over two Z squared. And I have two cubed, eight, one, okay, yeah. And I've got the two out front here now. And we still have to evaluate that. But wait, we still have to evaluate that. So, that being the case, well, we've got this. Step two is now commencing. Let's go ahead and integrate that. And of course, let's see here. We get two sigma. Here we have b cubed over 24, z plus b over 6, z cubed. That would be evaluated at a over 2 to a over 2. Let's go at it. Two sigma. We have B cubed times A all divided by, let's see, 48 plus B A cubed over, well, 2 cubed is 8 times 6 is again 48. Oops, excuse me. That's evaluating at the upper. And again, you'll notice if I rewrite, if I write this, I'll get B cubed A over 48 minus B A cubed over 48. And again, I've got a minus, minus, minus. So these would be pluses. So I've got one B cubed A over 48, two B cubed A over 48. So this will be equal to four sigma b cubed a over 48 plus b a cubed over 48. And we're in the home stretch. Say, oh, goody, goody. The four cancels the 48. This becomes 12 for each of these. So we can pull that out. And here I'm going to substitute back in what sigma represents. So I get something that says m over 12 ab times b cubed a plus b a cubed. Oh, goody, goody. The AB cancels, I get a two, I get a two. So what am I left with at the end? I get something that says, well, the moment of inertia of a rectangular plate about the center is simply A squared plus B squared. 
times m over 12. There is, again, for 2D. Pretty cool, right? Oh? Well, seriously? Oh, I knew it. I knew it. Cool. We'll do one more example and then we'll call it quits. I won't even do this one, I mean, in terms of the calculations. But for example, for a round, thin disc, actually, I guess it could be anything. It could be a big, thick disc as well. Okay, but I'll, I'll do a thin disc like this. Okay, The moment of inertia will be equal to one half the mass of the disc times r squared. And I said, I mentioned, oh yeah, we should at least think about what the parallel axis theorem does. So say I have that same disc and I decide to rotate it about one edge, slightly off, but that's, well, what will this, the total be here? And this is where we would apply something like our parallel axis theorem. You'd say, okay, well, about the center is one half m r squared. And then the motion of the center of mass about that axis, the pivot, would be an additional, well, the mass is m, and it's a distance r squared away. So rotating a disk about one edge must have a moment of inertia of 3 halves m r squared. So there you go. Well, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, this could be, well, what happens if you have something that's not nice? How about some not nice shape? How would you find the moment of inertia of that? Something that's not nice. Say, for example, you have three thin bars, you know, in some arrangement like this. That's a pretty big thick bar, but, and say you're rotating it about, I don't know, um, pick some place. Say you're doing it right here. Eesh, this looks bad, right? And we'll say that this is a distance L. Say each of these bars is a mass M and a distance L. Well, shoot, how would you get the moment of inertia of this sucker? I'll call this bar one, I'll call this bar two, I'll call this bar three. Well, first of all, I total, you could say, well, that's equal to the moment of inertia of the individual bars. That'd be the first step. And then you could say, well, bar one's being rotated about its end. I guess we could argue bar two is as well. So we'll say something like uh, about a bar about its end is what, one-third ml squared? One-third ml squared. And then the issue really becomes, well, how do I think about the rotation, how much it costs to do bar three? And I say, don't worry about it. Well, do worry about it, but the first question is, what's the moment of inertia of bar three about its center of mass? You say, oh, I know that. That's one-twelfth ml squared. And then the next question is, well, what is the rotation of the center of mass about that pivot right here? And the thing that you'd have to think about is, well, what's the distance of this yellow arrow? And depending on how I set it up, of course, you see that you basically have a right triangle where this is L over 2 and this is a distance L. So the hypotenuse would be L squared plus L squared over four square rooted. Or if you prefer, the square root of five L squared over four. So over here, we've got the mom moment of inertia about the center and we could plug in, well, the moment of inertia of the center of mass about the pivot point. That would be M times 5L squared over 4. 
Yeah, we're off to the races. We have 2ml squared over 3 plus 1 twelfth ml squared plus, I guess we do 15ml squared over 12. So I guess I better change this into an 8. Find the common denominator, 8 over 12. So 8 twelfths, 9 twelfths, 24 twelfths. This would give me an answer of 2 ml squared. So that's a different way of doing it. You can, after you have some of these smaller shapes, you can start pasting them together in different ways. You know, for example, okay, well, what's the moment of inertia of, um, you know, a disc at the end of a thin rod, like a, a pendulum clock, right? The pendulum on a grandfather clock. You'd say, well, that could be modeled as a thin rod of length L and mass M with a bob on the end of radius R and mass M2. You say, well, what's the moment of inertia about that rotation point? Okay. Cool. Well, I'll call it there for right now. That's a pretty long video. Um, I say, take another look at it, keep going at it, and uh, we'll treat torques next time. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you soon.